It's finally chilly here in the UK at the moment. We've had frosty mornings, we've had days where you can see your breath appear in front of you, and I am so excited about it. I have all of the knitting mojo, it would appear, but not so much of the knitting time. And so let's sit down, let's unpack that, let's share it, and that hopefully between us we'll have this season well and truly covered. there pickles and welcome to episode 33 of the Knitting Vicariously podcast. My name is Caroline, I'm found more commonly across Instagram and Ravelry as Dunderknit. I'm a knitter living here in London in the UK and if this is your first time joining us here on the podcast, a huge hello and welcome to you. I do like to mention just up front that I do tend to get a little bit sweary on this podcast, so if the cursing and the bad language is not your bag, I totally appreciate it. This won't be the podcast for you, but for the rest of you who know entirely what you're in for, whether this is your second time, your umpteenth time watching the podcast, a huge hello to you. I hope you are all incredibly well. As I said up front, it is cold here. Now I know this isn't universal, I know enough about geography and the general planet and way of things to know that's not really how this shit works. So to those of you who are down under or who in southern hemisphere climbs in some form or another, I hope you're enjoying the warming weather and that you're starting to break out some cotton, some linens, thinking about your summer knits. We here in the northern hemisphere are going rather the opposite direction. The clocks have gone back, the nights are now darker, the mornings are distinctly cold and I'm fucking loving it. Um, there have been a few very frosty starts in the morning and I will confess that living in a not particularly well insulated London terraced house has made for some chillier starts than I would really have liked. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's... Oh. It's it's definitely been chilly. I've had to crank out the hand knit socks and use them as bed socks on more than one occasion because sexy. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's definitely been a little bit chillier. That said, I do know that friends over in Brooklyn are experiencing like minus ten, minus eleven temps at the moment, which is what low. 20s, teens in the Fahrenheit's? I don't know. Uh, I do know how Celsius work, however, and I do know that minus 11 is fucking cold. So <laughs> you very much have my sympathies at the moment. It's been down to maybe kind of minus two here overnight, so just around about sort of very high 20s, low 30s in Fahrenheit. Nothing really to write home about, but chilly enough for me to be cracking out all of the winter knits and reveling in them, not least of which, as you will see, is this mohair delight I will touch on a little bit later. But yes, chilly, good, happy, excellent news. Other things to mention right here up front, the Blame Dunderknit Along, it is back and it is underway. I will be spending a little bit more time talking about it at length later on in the episode, but right here up front, just to mention, this is our Make Along that kicked off on the 1st of November. It runs until the end of January, and essentially what it is, is my way of allowing you to absolve yourself entirely of any accountability, any guilt, any responsibility you may feel in casting on whatever your heart desires. Yes, indeed, because this is a time of year as we start to roll in towards holidays where a lot of attention is placed on obligations, on gifts, on doing things for the benefit of others. And I just think at this time of year, it's a great opportunity for us to really celebrate and enjoy and take time in creating something that is very much what our own little hearts desire. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be for you. It could be a gift knit if you really want it to be. If so, you are a better person than I am, that is for sure. But what it does is it allows you to just really embrace whether it is a little cheeky yarn purchase, whether it's a pattern purchase, whether it is a new cast on that you've been struggling to justify, I am here to take that accountability off your hands and therefore feel free to use my name in vain and please do post about it over on Instagram and in our Ravelry threads. There will be prizes linked to this knit along. I will tell you a little bit more about it in all its detail a little bit later on this episode. 
One other thing to mention right up front, and that is our giveaway. Now I do have a slight apology for this one as well, but before I get into that and my own just indeterminate stupidity, <laughs> we have the Vicarious Rhinebecking giveaway, which was an opportunity to win a little prize package that I pulled together when I was out in Rhinebeck last month. I pulled together a few goodies, I showed them on the previous podcast, including this fabulous tote bag from Tanny Casey and some skeins of yarn from Jill Draper, from Loop and indeed from the Dye Project as well as some pins from Black Pearl Magic and the Nerdbird Makery. Now hopefully all of you who wanted to had an opportunity to enter with a couple of exceptions and here is where my stupidity comes to bear. Um, I talked about on the previous episode that I was going to be running this giveaway until Friday the 8th of November. I also posted in the thread to say that I would be running this giveaway until Friday the 8th of November. So Sunday the 3rd of November rolls around and I think to myself, oh fuck, I told everyone that I was going to close the giveaway on Friday the 1st of November and so I went into the thread and closed it. Because I'm an idiot. And I literally didn't even read the text that I put in there to say Friday the 8th of November because I am an idiot. Um, so yeah, so I know a couple of people messaged me. I've only seen those messages today. I'm really fucking sorry. Um, I hope there weren't too many of you affected by that. And just if you were, please, please, please just take my unending apologies for just being utterly daft and not checking things properly. Um, it's been a mad couple of weeks with work. There's been some other stuff that's been going on that's not brilliant. But at the same time, it's really no excuse for the fact that I fucked up a little bit there and I'm incredibly sorry. So to those of you who didn't get a chance to enter because I closed it a little bit ahead of schedule, I'm really sorry. Uh, dick move and I will endeavour to do better in all future circumstances. That said, when it came to allocating the prize winner, so what I did was in the Ravelry group we had 861 posts, which is batshit insane. Thank you so much to everybody who entered and to the five people who proactively got in touch with me on various channels to say that they had missed out on entering the giveaway. I kind of notionally allocated a further five posts to each of you, so 862, 63, blah blah blah. Um, so when it came to actually drawing for it I did try to take you into account. Now I disregarded post number one which was mine and indeed post number 861 which was also mine and so in drawing the prize winner. As I say, hopefully that makes some allowance for the fact that I am an idiot. Um, that being said, when I did draw the prize winner, the prize winner was number 665 and that is Shorna's Brown. Now, Shorna's Brown is based in Australia, in New South Wales, and uh, I'd fairly kind of assume uh, and point out that that was a fairly large part in why she wasn't able to make it to Rhinebeck this year. She was doing a little bit of working and was checking up on uh, YouTube vlogs or posts when they came through and so hopefully Shorna's Brown this gives you an opportunity to appreciate a little bit of Rhinebeck for your very very own. If you could please drop me a message over on Ravelry with the um, line about being our giveaway winner in your entry I will grab some details from you and get your prize package on its way to you soon. I know that Rhinebeck is one of those knitting events that is sort of wildly touted as being like the peak of the knitting community's calendar and don't get me wrong it is amazing but I also appreciate that not everyone can get there for a series of different reasons. Perhaps it's not your bag, perhaps it's just not somewhere that you're ever going to be able to justify getting to um, whether through distance or whether just through funds and so I totally totally appreciate that. Hopefully by checking out some of the podcasts the vlogs and the mentions over the last couple of weeks you've been able to experience a little part of it for yourself if that is your bag. I've certainly had a little bit of a Rhinebeck come down. I've been catching up on a few vlogs and posts from the last couple of weeks as well. In particular those from Earth Tones Girl that I posted about over on Instagram. Denise, you're a delight and it was amazing to follow along with you over the course of the weekend. Similarly, the wonderful Caitlin and Jackie of Caddy Jack's Knits who talked a little bit about our meeting on the hill for the first time, which was 
hilarious and one of my favourite moments of the weekend. Um, if you haven't checked out their podcast, please do. But um, as a sort of um, summary version of events, I think it's fair to say that Caitlin has an epic poker face and that Jackie fell for it hook, line and sinker and that made me very, very happy. <laughs> There are plenty of videos from Rhinebeck Weekend should you wish to get involved. I know in particular the Christy Glass Show Me Your Rhinebeck Sweater or Tell Me About Your Rhinebeck Sweater from this year was a mammoth, mammoth video. And I know that MD Quilter, who is a fabulous, fabulous individual who I was lucky enough to meet and a really dedicated participant in our glorious gold along this year. She appears at around about the 53 minute mark of that video resplendent in her gold Ursa and her hat Dana and one it was amazing to meet you in person and two thank you so much for mentioning the glorious gold along. It just it made my heart so happy when I got to that point and um, yeah really really appreciate it again to everybody who took part um, and it was so wonderful to meet you in person. But enough gadding about, let's get into the knitting for this episode. Now, as ever, you'll find show notes in the description box below, which you can find just by tapping the little down arrow immediately below the video. You can also find them over on Ravelry, where we are in the Knitting Vicariously podcast group. Please do feel free to search for that over there. There are individual threads for each and every episode, complete with show notes. And you'll also find a wonderful community of individuals engaged in chatter on all sorts of topics from our um, blamed under knit along projects and chatter thread there all the way through to vicarious and actual knits as well. You can also find us over on Instagram where we have the Knitting Vicariously Instagram account separate from my own personal account and a place where again with each new episode I'll update with a new post and link to hashtags and relevant makers, nope, relevant hashtags and makers in that episode thread as well. But here we are, let's get into things. And the very first thing that I will talk about is a sweater that you may have seen before. I talked about this last year. This is my no frills sweater and it is perfect for the current weather because it's still reasonably lightweight, but it is so cozy and so fluffy. It's so fluffy. It's amazing. This is knit out of, well first of all it's a pattern by Petite Knit. I'll put a picture of it here up on the screen just to remind you. In terms of sizing, I know that Petite Knit in general, some of her sizing is not as inclusive as it could be. Certainly this sweater, I believe the largest size it goes up to, is around about 120 centimetres for the bust which is the size that I've knitted here, albeit with some modifications. It is a straightforward and simple raglan and so in theory it should be easy enough to modify but also in practice you shouldn't really have to do that. Um, ideally patterns are written with a broad enough range of sizes in mind to make them fairly inclusive and I think it's fair to say this is a little bit on the smaller side of things so not ideal. I know a few people have spoken to her in the past about potentially expanding the range of sizes. I know it's something that is on her agenda but at the moment obviously just something I want to mention up. Front. But this is knit out of Vullenvine yarns. It is Vullenvine number no. nine, which was Kristen's signature mauve. Although I believe, having watched her latest episode, she has reimagined it slightly and brought it down a couple of notches. So a little bit less pink and a little bit more kind of smoky, dusky, just beautifully moody colours that she does so incredibly well. Um, but this is two of her yarns held together. It is her Ghost Lace, which is her Kid Silk Mohair um, blend, and it is also her um, Volca base, which is her MCN held together. So this is, it's just, I love it. I am gonna stand up just so you can appreciate the floof in a little bit more detail. Look at it, look at the floof, I mean, it's a little bit hard to see some of the floof, but look at that. Look at that good halo action you've got going on there. It is divinely soft, squishy, slightly pilly, ever so slightly. But yeah, I love 
this sweater. Um, it is, as I say, I knit the largest size, so about 120 centimetres. There's quite a lot of ease built into this at the moment, so that's kind of me. Boob shot, gratuitous boob shot uh, sweater, quite a bit bigger. Um, as I say, I did modify this ever so slightly. I think I did slightly fewer increases on the raglans than it called for. Um, so I have obviously sort of shortened the arm side a little bit. I know this is shorter. It's quite a sort of dolman sleeve pattern originally and it also means it's probably not the full 120 centimeters that I've got in terms of the width but I love it. Um, it is just got a little bit of rib down here right at the bottom and I alternated skeins throughout because hand dyed yarn didn't want flashes of pulling across the boobs. No one needs that. Anyway I'm gonna sit down now. So there you have it. I won't go into sort of too much detail about this. I have talked about it at length in a previous episode. You can find um, my project page. I will make sure that's linked in the show notes below. But I feel as though I talked about this round about, I wanna say sort of high single digits, low double digits, maybe about episode 10-ish, that would be a guess. But um, yes, if you do want to find out a little bit more about this sweater, please do feel free to check that out. But into this week's episode. Now, I have no finished objects to share with you this week, and there's quite a good reason for that, because if nothing else, the blame under knit along is an excellent opportunity for me to also throw caution to the wind and cast on whatever the fuck I like. So <laughs> it, you know, works slightly differently in the sense that my accountability is, is on me, and therefore I kind of am blaming myself, but if we don't go too deep into the general psychology, actually, actually, it would be weird for me not to cast on something for a knit along that I'm doing, so I kind of have to. So actually, actually, I blame you for what's happened here, because you have expectations of me, and like, I sit in front of a wall of yarn and people expect me to cast things on. So I did not want to disappoint you. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot that we could say about the psychology of that, but let's not bother. So in terms of works in progress then, um, it's fair to say, I haven't really touched those. So the socks that I showed on previously that were knit um, as a large part of my trip over to Rhinebeck, yeah, haven't really touched them. Couple of rounds during the commute in the morning, not really touched them. Um, my Sova Bellin sweater that I took with me as well, I haven't really touched that. Kind of in two minds about that one. Um, if I'm honest, I love the idea of having a green cabled sweater. That was very much my reason for casting it on. But the more I think about it, the more I think, while Sova Bellin is a pattern that I want to knit, I'm not sure it's a pattern I want to wear. Hmm. Um, all I mean by that, and it's a beautiful, beautiful sweater, do not get me wrong, that it's just that I've been thinking a little bit more and trying to be quite astute about the sorts of um, shapes and patterns that I have in my wardrobe that I love wearing, and I absolutely adore wearing my shifted pullover, my bottom-up um, gold, the sweater that I knit for the gold long, um, all over cables, the sort of rope braid cables down the front. I love wearing that sweater, I love the shape of it, I love everything about it. By contrast I have sort of raglan style cable sweaters that I don't get nearly enough wear out of and so Thinking about it, Sova Bellin is, I will put a picture up here because I'm now talking about it, so I may as well <laughs> remind you of what I'm talking about. Um, I just don't have the project to hand to be able to showcase it. Um, but yes, the Sova Bellin is a sweater that I am contemplating at the moment. I It will be a lovely pattern to knit, and I've been enjoying it so far, the work that I've done on it. I'm just not sure how much wear I'm going to get out of it. And because I love the yarn that I'm knitting it in so much, it's this amazing sort of really deep, emeraldy, foresty green, um, which is an old colourway from Madeline Tosh. I am um, Laurel from Madeline Tosh. I am... Um, mm, leave it with me. Leave it with me. But anyway, 
That's a work in progress and not one that I've been working on. So let's move on, shall we? So the first thing I want to talk to you about is in my Nerd Bird Makery bag. This is a bag that I picked up from Indie Untangled over in the US. I talked about it last week. It is a fantastic bag. It's drawstring, but it also has all of these amazing individual makers on it, whether you be sewists, whether you be crocheters, whether you be knitters, whether you be makers, it is the most wonderful fabric that emphasises differences and diversity and differently abled and it is just a delight. So I love this bag, it makes me smile every time I use it. But that is not the only thing about this bag that makes me smile because in here... <laughs> Oh, you're going to need to forgive me for a second. All right, I'm going to put a pin in that thought and we'll come back to it. In here is my Felix sweater. Felix is a pattern by Amy Christoffers. I talked about this when I brought my yarn back from Rhinebeck and talked about the fact that I was very excited to cast this on. My good friend Emily, who is Bookcase Hat on Ravelry and Emily Caroline over on Instagram, had knit not one but two versions of this sweater and I ogled both of them at quite inappropriate length. And so <laughs> it made sense to cast on one of my own. Now, the yarn that I'm using for this is also yarn that I brought back from Rhinebeck. In fact, I will give you a little yarn shot up front. It is this gorgeous, gorgeous Jill Draper yarn. This is her Mini Empire Heathers base, which is a sort of worsted to iron weight base in the lipstick colorway, and it is beautiful. Let me hold it up here for you to see. Isn't it stunning? So it's a Heather's base, which means it's a mix of black and sort of natural coloured yarn, which gives it this amazing heathered effect. There's quite a lot of veg matter in there that I am picking out as I go, but I love this yarn so much. It's the perfect kind of neppy, tweedy, ugh, yarn of dreams. It is, uh, in terms of its makeup and base, it is Rambouillet. Um, so it is just gorgeously plump. It's described on her, on her website as having a slightly cottony hand and I don't disagree entirely. It is, if I hold it here for you to see, it is quite a tight plied yarn. It's, I believe it's a four ply and um, certainly it's got quite a sort of sturdy um, a kind of structure to it when it, when you're working it up. It's not a kind of soft and, and very kind of malleable um, woolen spun. It's definitely got a bit more kind of sturdiness to it, um, if that makes any sense at all. Um, cottony is maybe a little bit of a stretch, although it is, um, as I say, quite sturdy to work with. So I, I don't know, perhaps cottony isn't too far of a stretch. I am not a spinner and therefore my, my um, language and terminology is somewhat lacking in this area but hopefully some of that may have made sense. Um, but no, I'm in love with this yarn and the way that it is working up. I oh, just, it's amazing. So let me show you my sweater. So the reason why I had a little chuckle to myself right there up front is because, do you remember in previous episodes where I've done this whole, I really love this thing and then realised it is very similar to uh, to something else that I've already got going on. Um, yeah, so let's let's talk about kind of mauvey pink raglan sweaters, shall we? Shall we? Because be, be because fuck's sake, <laughs> I am nothing if not predictable in pink this week. Um, which may have to be the title of the episode. This is my Felix sweater in progress. You will see I've done a fair old bit of work on this. Now that's partly because this is fairly heavyweight yarn and therefore it's working up pretty swiftly, but it's also because I fucking love this thing. Um, it has this gorgeous little bit of lace shaping on the raglands, as you can see. Hi! Um, it's just beautiful. So let me hold it up so you can appreciate it in all of its beauty. 
there we are. Apologies, you've got a little bit of shadow from the camera at the moment. Apologies too if the focusing is intermittently a bit crap. Um, again, I'm trying to work with the natural light that I have here at the moment, what little there is of it, and it does mean that every now and again the focus just gets a little smidge confused. But you can see how beautifully this yarn is working up. I am in absolute raptures with this base. There is no way that Jill Draper is watching this, but if any of one knows her, um, if this came in different weights, this this um, yarn base in terms of the heatheredness, um, because I love it in the worst weight, I just that it's it's fantastic for chunky knits, but there's something about just everything to do with the way that it takes the colour, the little gorgeous kind of nets and flecks of very vibrant pink that are in here from the undyed wool that's then been dyed with the pink over the top. I love it so much. If this came in different weights, I swear I would just give you all of my money and, and we'd be fine because it's incredible. I love how this is working up. It's still got a kind of hand dyedness to it because obviously there is a lot of tonality in the colour but it's not quite the kind of super wash type um, sort of variegation that you see. It's far more kind of heathery and I am very very into that at the moment. So um, yes, this is as I say, my Felix pullover. I've raptured, I've rhapsodized on about the yarn quite enough by now. In terms of needles, um, the ribbing is knit on a 5.5 millimeter needle, which is gonna be a US nine, I believe. Whereas the main body of the sweater is knit on six millimeters, which is another reason it's gone so bloody quickly. And those sixes are, and I'm just double checking this, yep, a US size 10. So speeding along. In terms of the original pattern, um, Amy Christoffers does recommend that you hold uh, a sort of worsted weight yarn or an iron weight yarn together with some mohair. Um, I chose not to do that. I really, really like this yarn on its own. I also have a pink mohair sweater that's raglan shaped. <laughs> oh, I'm an idiot. Um, and therefore I really didn't need to. I mean, having two pink raglan sweaters already feels like a bit of a stretch. Don't like, don't get me wrong, I'm being flippant. This is clearly a very different-ish shade of pink. <laughs> oh my. Um, but yeah, I am very much looking forward to having this done. Now, this is at the end, and you can see here I've got an end sort of waggling wildly, um, that's because I've just finished my second cake of yarn and what I think I'm going to do next is rather than continue on the body because this is intended to be a little bit cropped, I have two skeins left and what I'm going to do is start on the sleeves and I will work on those, knit myself some full length sleeves and then hopefully have enough to knit the body um, a little bit cropped, perhaps not too cropped. I have just sat with myself for a little bit and gone, should I buy another skein? Should I get another skein just in case? Or maybe I'll get another skein. I have decided against that for now, for now, because I know that if I did do that, I would also buy another sweater's quantity of this yarn. <laughs> Not in this colour. The leaf colourway is definitely calling my name. It's the most beautiful heathered green. It's this, but a beautiful deep heathery green. And I love it. But I have so much yarn case in point, I brought even more of it back from Rhinebeck. I do not need another sweater quantity. I love it, but I do not need it. So we're making do with this for the time being. So I am going to knit full length sleeves next on my six millimeter needles, see how far that gets me with the yarn and then use the rest of it for the body. But I love this so much. The second project that I've been working on for the last couple of weeks is another cast on and uses Rhinebeck yarn because it's not as though I have a stash of yarn to work through or anything. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this is also a pattern that I mentioned on the previous episode, although I completely forgot to put pictures and mention it in the show notes. So let me please rectify that now. I have cast on the Stoker Shawl by Kristen Lehrer, who is, of course, the inimitable, the wonderful Vine of the Vine podcast and indeed Vine yarns. This is a new pattern that she released a couple of months ago now, and I adore it so, so much. I 
Kristen's patterns are wonderful, Kristen's yarns are beautiful, um, but I have to say, when I saw this, I thought this would make the snuggliest, the most beautiful shawl to be all wrapped up in, and I happened to come across some yarn when I was at Rhinebeck that I just thought would be perfect for it. I have two skeins of it that are living down here, in my stash wall, so I have managed to fit a few of my Rhinebeck yarns into the stash wall. Not all of them, not gonna lie, <laughs> but those ones are in there for now, although one of them has already been caked up. So let me show you the yarn first of all. This is yarn that again I talked about in the previous episode. It is by a company that were new to me. This is by a company called Utopia excellent name and this is their sustainable base it's a dk weight yarn and it is made of just some truly truly gorgeous sheepy and wooliness and it's so delightfully squishable it is a mixed blend of wools so this is a mix of merino of targi of coriadale and of rambouillet and it is stunning and similarly, I mentioned last time, it is incredibly soft as yarns go as well. So this is something I knew I wanted up and around my neck. And in particular, now that we are getting into the colder months, which I feel I may have mentioned in this episode, having something that is non-superwash, that is a little bit more sort of woolly wool, whilst also being deliciously soft, this is going to keep me so unbelievably cosy. I'm very excited, but enough about that. Let me show you the actual shawl itself. Now, I'm not hugely far along. I have made a little bit of headway and here it is so far. You can see one of the most beautiful design elements of Kristen's design are these fantastic bubbles up and down the spine of the shawl. So I'm holding it the wrong way up, which doesn't help for starters, so let me do that and rectify that now. But here we go, this is the progress I've made so far. There is a fabulous part of the pattern repeat which takes you through making these bubbles. I have nine of these to do up front. I think I've done one, two, three, four, five, six, seven so far maybe? Six or seven? Seven. Um, and then once I get through this section I'm going to start more of the texture on this side area here but as I say if I hold it up you can see how this yarn is knitting it is beautiful um, this is in terms of gauge it's on a four millimeter needle which is a US size six I am getting great gauge for this it is perfectly soft and drapey when blocked it will be drapier still I am quite sure but at the same time it, there's not so much kind of looseness to the gauge that I'm going to get wind howling through it or anything like that so I'm already so excited about having this cuddled up and around my neck it's going to be an absolutely delicious shawl. So yes, really good simple going. As with all of Kristen's patterns that I've worked on, it's a very well written pattern. You have a little bit of a garter tab cast on up here and then the rest of it is then just kind of increasing working back and forth. It is purled on the wrong side, which makes those rows nice and quick to zip along and through. And as I say, some really clever stuff that she's doing here with the spine that I absolutely adore. It's also the time that I'm getting the most consistent bubbles that I have had to date on previous projects. So um, yeah, really, really pleased about that and enjoying working on this so far. So those are my works in progress for this week. But what I didn't do was I didn't tell you where my Stoker shawl is living at the moment. And that is because I want to move gently into acquisitions. Now, Caroline, you say, you've just come back from Rhinebeck. You had, in the last episode, a metric shit ton of acquisitions. You're not wrong. You are not wrong. Um, which is why it makes it all the more galling that last weekend was an event here in London called Make Joy. Now, Make Joy is, uh, was a fantastic event. It was predominantly kind of a social event, but there were a few vendors that were brought along. It was over 
in sort of central southwest London, right next to some of our amazing museums in the centre of town. And it just so happened that I had purchased a ticket a few months before. I also found out the day before going that my mum had also purchased a ticket. Hello, mum. Um, and so the two of us ended up venturing along and checking out some of those wares there. Now, I had no intention of buying anything. And I think we can all gather that that went really badly. <laughs> But yes, it was a really fantastic event. Just the first thing to mention is to everybody that came up and said hi, to those of you I was able to stop and to have a chat with, thank you so much. It was lovely to meet you. Thank you so much as well to everyone who came up and said hi to Dunder Mum, as she has now been christened, because that was wonderful too. I know she had a good chat with a few people there. And uh, so really, really do appreciate everyone that came up and said hello. But yeah, there's really no getting away from it. I did make a couple of cheeky purchases. Now, the first of those have been on screen this whole time. Ah, yeah. Um, it's not yarn. Actually, I didn't purchase any yarn. And so I'm very, you know, kind of happy about that. I really had no need to. But the first of my purchases are, in fact, these little beauties. So these earrings here are hand crocheted, I know, in the most beautiful rose gold wire. I am going to try and get a little bit closer so you can see. Well, hello there, all up in your business. These are the most beautiful earrings. As you can see, they are, as I mentioned, hand crocheted using this amazing rose gold wire. There are three little beads on there as well, which are absolutely perfect. And I love these. I love these an awful lot. These are made by Malika, who is a vendor that I've seen at a number of yarn shows. I know she was at EYF earlier on this year, as well as being a local at my local yarn store. So I'm going to pop her box here up on the screen. This is her here. And as I say, you can see them glinting away there in the background. I absolutely adore these. So yes, I will link her details in the show notes below, but she is at malika.co.uk. There were some beautiful, beautiful earrings and uh, other jewellery. She makes necklaces, incredible rings as well. Just all of it was stunning. And um, I have to confess, there were two that I had my eye on. And thank you so much to Ellen, who I met there as well, uh, who I believe is Ellen Craig on Instagram, for getting the green version of these and making my decision so much easier. <laughs> So yes, Ellen, we are now earring twinsies and I hope you've been enjoying yours this week as well. Now, I mentioned the Make Joy event on the podcast here a couple of weeks ago because I knew it was one of the places where Hyde and Hammer, who is new, was going to be selling some of her incredible project bags in person. They can be quite difficult to get hold of. I know that her site and her updates tend to sell out very quickly when new bags are posted. And so having managed to score one of her amazing gingerbread bags that I've talked about in the past here on the podcast, I went over because I wanted to say hi and introduce myself and then this happened. It happened. <laughs> this, I mean, how could I not? How could I possibly not? Because gold. We know this. This is very predictable. This is one of her original 03 Hayden Hammer bags. It is made out of the wax canvas in the mustard gold colour and it has this fabulous belt buckle here on the top. My gingerbread canvas one has a stud fastening, this has the belt fastening, I love them both very very much. She has details like her little hand stamped hide and hammer logo on the bag just here which you can appreciate, it is stunningly beautiful. I was delighted to see these in person. I was even more delighted to bring one of them home with me. It wasn't what I intended, but I was very grateful for it. <laughs> And just a very quick side note, because I do know sometimes that particularly when you have online vendors and makers and people who have updates that are scheduled or um, that tend to go up on sale at very certain and specific times, it can sometimes be difficult to get hold of those goods. I know that New is a great example of that. As I say, her hide and hammer bags sell out very quickly. I'm sitting here wearing a jumper that's made out of woolen vine yarns, who also has updates that sell out almost within minutes. 
And so I know that it is sometimes quite difficult to get hold of some of these things if you've seen people like myself talking about them and decide that that is very much what your heart is set on to only go and to find that either the updates are at times that you're gonna find difficult to make or even that when you do get there sometimes things sell out before you have a chance to actually make a purchase. I absolutely appreciate how frustrating that can be for all intents and purposes this, you know, this sweater quantity took me, I think, a good couple of updates before I was able to finally pin it down. Similarly, I've had experiences in the past where I've been cart jacked, the expression to um, find things have disappeared from your cart before you get to a point of paying for them. Um, there's a couple of things I want to say with that. One of those is it is never, ever the fault of the sellers that their goods are that popular. Now, I appreciate there are some sellers out there who have ways of making things work on their website. There are carts that perhaps allow things to stay in there once they have been placed in. I also know that those, and again, this is more of a work thing than it is a social thing or a hobby thing, but I also know that there are compromises that come with implementing those kind of solutions on websites and web stores. And so sometimes it's not a straight exchange. Sometimes you have to give up some functionality that's in incredibly useful in order to have that be in place. I know it's difficult to get hold of these things sometimes. I know I sit here in front of a literal wall of privilege talking about more privilege and that that is not everybody's cup of tea. Um, if it is something that you want to invest some of your money in, being able to support makers from this community is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And ideally, we'd all be able to do it as often as we like. However, demand is such that not everyone is always able to purchase those things. And I just want to make it abundantly clear that if you aren't, and if for whatever reason you can't, by all means try again. By all means write a, a sort of lovely polite note telling the maker how much you enjoy their work and asking if there is any possibility for them to do a pre-order or a custom order. If not, and that's not the way that they work, then that's just the, you know, them's the breaks. And so, try again next time. I do have some hints and tips that I can give you for being able to be sort of particularly speedy. Um, those break down roughly as make sure that if um, the seller uses an account system on their website, so in other words, if you can create an account, make sure that you've done so and make sure that you're logged into that account ahead of time. Make sure it has your address details in there ahead of time. So all of that is ready to go. You're not wasting time filling out information. Um, if you use PayPal, log in to PayPal ahead of time in a different browser window and that way it shouldn't ask you to log in and again waste time in that sense. If you know what it is that you're looking for, really focus and hone in on those things. Sometimes what can happen is you'll be distracted. I'm very guilty of this. I've gone in, I've been distracted by one listing, and at that point in time, the other ones that I put in my basket have gone. What I try to do is be very single-minded with what I want. So I will go on, I will put the things that I want in my basket, ideally one sweater quantity or, or two sort of listings of yarn, and try and keep it to as few clicks as possible so I can get through the checkout journey as quickly as possible. I'll prioritise the ones that I think are likely to go first and then potentially make multiple orders. If I make multiple orders, I may have to suck up the fact that I have to pay postage on multiple orders because not everyone combines shipping. It is, to use the technical term, an absolute fucking ball ache to do so. So I wouldn't put that on anyone else. I either take my chances and um, try and buy all of the things that I want, risking the fact that I may lose some of them if they go very, very quickly, or I will have to suck up the fact that I may have to pay extra postage. Now, I try not to do that from the US because obviously very expensive and customs, double whammy. Just the reason I mention this is because over the year or so that I've been doing this, I know that I have talked about a couple of different makers, about um, a couple of different independent creatives. And I know that people have seen their goods on the podcast here and gone and started to look very excitedly to try and purchase some of their own. I also know very anecdotally, this is not linked to any one particular maker. I've had a handful of conversations over the course of this year um, that sometimes people get very frustrated 
when they can't get hold of those products and have written to the makers in question and talked about how you know they've seen them talked about here and yet they can't get them and that's very very frustrating for them. I appreciate that. I appreciate how, how frustrating it can be. It is not the maker's fault. They are usually working longer working days than I am um, and I know that from speaking to individuals, knowing having individuals as friends who are makers, either full-time or part-time, I know that those who are doing it full-time are working harder than I am in terms of the length of days and the days of the week. And those of them who are doing part-time are usually doing it part-time alongside full-time jobs. And so, look, I am not here to tell you how to react in any given situation. You are grown people and therefore you're entitled to react in any way that you so choose. All I'm saying is, from my perspective, I get frustrated from time to time. I do not at any point blame the individual makers um, because it's their job. The fact that they're so successful is fucking awesome and it makes me very happy. And if there is something that I'm really, really keen to try and get hold of, I will attempt to proactively go out of my way and message them. And if they can make it, they will usually try to make it happen. That's not because I am in any way special, but rather because they will try to make their customers happy if they are good business people. If custom orders, pre-orders just aren't in their wheelhouse, it's not what they offer, they will usually try and ensure that they take into account the fact that there is extra demand for some of those products and put more of those into the shop next time round, increasing everyone's chances. Look, as I say, I'm not here to belittle, to bemoan, to begrudge anyone any feelings whatsoever in regards to this happening. All I'm saying is I've been on that side too. I've been frustrated. Things have sold out. I haven't been able to get things. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's yarn. It's a bag. It's a beautiful bag. It's beautiful yarn. They're amazing needles and stitch markers. But at the end of the day, I'm good. Like, if I have to find another option, I will find another option. The amazing thing about this community is there are so many people out there doing incredible, incredible work. And so if it's not exactly that, I can find something else. And sometimes maybe it's just not worth the hassle of trying to work through the updates. And sometimes it very much is. And just, you know, essentially words to live by. It's just fucking yarn. Right, ramble over. That's not what I wanted to spend a huge amount of time talking about, but an important subject nevertheless. So those are my acquisitions from Make Joy last weekend. It was, as I say, a fabulous event. I very, very much enjoyed it. I also enjoyed the number of people who came up to me who saw me holding different things like gold bags and sort of saying, oh yeah, typecast, mm, mm. <laughs> I love that I now have this reputation. Deservedly so, don't get me wrong. Two very quick pattern picks this week, things that have caught my eye and that I really can't quite shake. And completely out of left field for me, neither of them are sweater patterns. I know it's weird. I'm not sure how I feel about it. <laughs> It's it's a weird one for me. Usually I'm all about the sweaters, but at the moment, I think because my extremities are so cold when I go outside um, that I, I have some sweaters. I don't have as many accessories as I would like, so they're definitely on my agenda for the immediate future. The first of these is a stunning pair of fingerless mitts that genuinely stopped me in my tracks as I was scrolling down my Instagram feed and I had to tap in and find out everything about them and just, I actually saved the post because I kept coming back to it and just, ugh. um, These are the Oak Hollow Mitts and they are by Diana Waller who is Cake and Vikings over on Instagram and Paper Tiger over on YouTube. She's a fantastic individual and these are truly glorious mitts. Now, I know what you're thinking, oh, it's because they're gold. Because again, typecast. Diana, you may have made that point already and I'm not gonna say that you're completely wrong, but I will say, while I love them because they're gold, it's not the only reason why I love them. They are beautiful. They are incredibly just autumnal in their design. I love the color combination of them here. And I have to confess, I've already started plotting what I'm gonna use to knit these up. So 
Last winter, I knit a pair of the, I believe it's pronounced Belize or Belisa mitts, and that's a pattern by Isolde Teague. I will put a picture of my mitts up here on the screen for you to see. These have been getting so much wear this year, and part of that is actually down to the modifications that I made. So you may be able to see from the pictures there, but um, I didn't bring them upstairs to record. That would have been far too organized of me. But um, in terms of modifications, I had um, actually folded over, I'd created a little folded cuff. So knit double length of ribbing and then folded it back on itself and then done, I think it was a bind off. So I'd done a three needle bind off to then fold those two elements together. I also knit the um, cuff here on the top much longer than the pattern suggested. So I knit it to the point where it almost completely covers my fingers and then I folded it back on itself. So again, I could wear it either with the cuff up so I can keep my fingers nice and cozy and tucked in or I can wear it with the cuff folded down. And I think those modifications have made a massive difference to the amount that I wear those. I also knit them using Rauma Phenol PT2, which is again quite woolly wool. It's quite, um, oh, it, it's definitely not sort of prickly, but it's also not the softest of yarns. But what it is, is ridiculously warm and I love it. And I do know that Roma have come out with some new heathered colorways. Knowing the love and deep admiration I have for my Jill Draper heathers that I'm using for my Felix pullover, you can imagine how much I've lost my heart to those colorways as well. So I am currently plotting uh, between a couple of different options, but I think a pair of those is going to need to be in my future. They're knit on, I believe it's two and a half millimeter needles and three millimeter needles, which is US size one and a half and a US size two and a half. You have halves as well as number, it makes no sense. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I will definitely have a pair of those at some point on the needles within the next few weeks, I suspect. The second pattern that has caught my eye for this episode is actually a scarf. Now, I know, again, weird, but um, I know I'm already knitting my Stoker shawl. That is going to be deliciously cosy, I am quite sure. But I do also quite love a scarf. I have one scarf that I've knit previously. I have the topiary scarf, which is a Michelle Wong pattern, which is beautiful. I knit it in a sort of slightly off cream, kind of very, very light, I wanna say very light beige, but I'm not sure that's entirely right. It's kind of an off cream colorway. It's got an ever so slightly greenish tinge to it, which I really do like, but it is, pilling quite badly because it's knit out of MCN and also it definitely needs a wash because it's a cream scarf and you can imagine how well that's gone over the years but obviously I will wash it at some point. I also have a wonderful gold scarf that my mum knit for me last Christmas which I love very much um, but this scarf is a little bit different. I'm going to put a picture of it up here now. This is the Mondays scarf by Camilla Vad, who is an incredible designer. She's published the Magnolia sweater as well as the Sirius pullover, number of different beautiful patterns and she has her own yarn as well which is, uh, she has a few different versions but certainly I know there is a lamb's wool which looks delicious. Um, Apparently that's my new word of choice this week. I'm using that a lot. Interesting. There we go. Um, but yes, this is a scarf that is kind of block colour with some stripes in there as well. In terms of the knitting, it is, not to put too fine a point on it, really bloody simple. Um, which makes me slightly nervous. It might get a little bit dull to knit up. But at the same time, think how wearable this would be in terms of colour combinations. There are so many options. I mean, it's not as though I have one or two single skeins of yarn and moustache that I could maybe think about doing some colour combinations with. Um, but certainly, I just, it really caught my eye and I thought how wearable it would be. Again, colour combinations have started playing in my head a little bit. I do have some options. So I've got up in here, I've got a couple of skeins from Rhinebeck last year of Green Mountain Spinnery Lamb's Wool, which has been sitting in my stash waiting for me to do something with. I've got another couple just out of shot there in terms of a very kind of dark berry colour, which I think is some old 
plucky that I've had in my stash for a while. Maybe they're Oxford base, which I think is a sort of fingering weight. Um, again, sort of slightly more rustic looking. Uh, merino cashmere blend doesn't feel rustic looks rustic so would fit quite nicely with the lambs wool in there I also have yarn that I brought back from uh, Brooklyn General last year which was my biche et bouche which is the petit lambs wool which again is beautiful so I've got some options and then similarly there's always Rauma again although it's perhaps not quite as soft next to the neck as the lambs wool would be so swings and roundabouts but all in all, just a really interesting one to play around with. The pattern itself is knit in her lamb's wool, which is a sport weight, but again, it's such a simple pattern, and it is, after all, a scarf, that you could play around with the stitch count to get it to the width that you wanted with the gauge that you have. I know she knits it on four millimetre needles, which is a US size six. I would probably go down a couple of needle sizes if I were using things like the Petit Lambs wool, uh, because that's a little bit finer. But again, you could play around with it as you go. So definitely one it's worth considering if you're in the market for a really mindless and yet incredibly wearable scarf. But as sources of inspiration go, you'd find it hard not to look much further than the blame Dunder Knit Along, because yes, our make along is back for 2019 and into 2020, and I am over the moon with the work that you are doing so far to use my name blindly and in vain. I am here for it, I have your back. The reaction to this year's make along has been amazing. I've been blown away with the responses to people who are genuinely overjoyed <laughs> and just incredibly happy to be casting on with our customary wild abandon. And so seeing your posts over on Instagram and on Ravelry has made me smile no end. Just a couple of bits of admin that I do want to cover off in this episode. So I mentioned previously that there will be a few ways to post about your Blame Dunder Knit Along entries. Those are now up and running. So to cover those off, there are three different ways that you can post about your Blame Dunder Knit Along entries. Each one of those will be eligible for a prize package. Now, as with last year, I'm going to be curating those over the next few weeks. Please do bear with me, but know that they are going to be smashers. I'm very excited about them. But um, each of the different three ways that you can post about it will make you eligible for those. The first way in which you're eligible to enter is in the Blame Dunder Knit Along chatter thread on our Ravelry group. This is an opportunity for anyone and everyone to engage with everyone who's working on projects where you can post about colour combinations, you can post about yarn choices, you can post progress updates, and of course you can go in and comment on everyone else's who are doing the same. I'm in just, I'm so in love with this thread because it's such a great opportunity for people to go in and to just encourage each other through it. Now, I do want to try and ensure it's not too spammy, so please do ensure that you're keeping your discussions on topic and making it relevant and engaging with others within the group as well. What I will be doing is I will take a random number generator at the end of the uh, Blame Dunder Knit Along, and one person who is posted in that group will be eligible for one of the prizes in there as well. The second way you can be eligible for a prize in our Blame Dunder Knit Along is by posting an FO in the FO thread, also in our Ravelry group. Now, this is a knit along and a make along that is not about finishing things. No indeed, because if you don't get around to it, if you just for whatever reason don't quite make it to the finish line, I don't want you to be penalised for that. However, those of you who do, you do get an extra entry. So for everyone who finishes objects as part of the Blame Dunder Knit Along, I invite you to post those in the FO thread. The only stipulation, and it is one to bear in mind, is that you will have one post per person. This is not about posting every single one of your FOs in there. This is about taking up one post and using that one post to then add in anything and everything you finish as part of it. So if you've posted once, I would then ask you to go back, find your original post and edit it to add any new pictures. So that way we're keeping it fair. So for everyone who has finished, whether it be one or 17 projects as part of the knit along and make along, you will be able to have one extra entry into the make along to win a prize. 
And lastly, the third way that you can do it is just by keeping me posted over on Instagram. So please do feel free to use the Blame Dungeon It Along hashtag, which is here on the screen, and you will be eligible for entries over there. Similarly, I will do a random number generator. I will, it's not random number. There are sites that I can use to essentially set date fields and put a hashtag against it. And then within that space of time, it will choose one post at random to allocate a prize to there as well. Now, again, please do try and keep it thematically appropriate. So make sure that you're highlighting your Blame Dungeon Long projects or possible yarns, anything that is aligned to the cal itself rather than being, you know, a post of your breakfast that morning. If it's a post of your breakfast with the project, I'm here for it. Love a good bit of breakfast. But um, yes, anything else may be a little bit too abstract to be linked directly to the hashtag. Three ways to win prizes all the fun of the fair. But look, as I've mentioned previously, prizes aren't necessarily the main focal point of this make along. This is all about getting to work on whatever it is that your heart desires and just casting aside any aspersions, any nervousness, any concerns that you have about whether or not that's something you should do and indeed just cracking the fuck on with it. And so in the spirit of cracking the fuck on with it, I bring to you now our Blame Dungeon It Along Gallery for 2019. This week's gallery is going to be taken from projects that have been posted over in the Ravelry threads. And so for your delectation, please enjoy. They're magnificent, aren't they? I I get such a kick out of seeing the projects that you're working on every single time. And so thank you to everybody who has cast on already and started working on their projects. Thank you to those of you who have been making 
gentle and informed yarn choices in the last couple of weeks as well. And to those of you who are still working out exactly what it is that you want to work on, setting aside some time for yourself to cast it on, any time between now and the end of January. It doesn't have to start in November. It doesn't have to have finished by the end of January. There is no pressure in that regard. This is just an opportunity for you to just seize the day and just enable yourself through me and my accountability to you as being someone who's got your back and will encourage you to do things that you maybe should but that is pretty much it for this episode of Knitting Vicariously. To those of you who are continuing your work on your Blamed Under Knit Along projects, I hope you're enjoying them. I hope they are making you very, very happy indeed. To those of you still plotting and planning, enjoy that part of the process too. Um, it only really remains for me then to wish you a very, very wonderful rest of day, rest of week. I hope your knitting is keeping you happy and fulfilled. But if for whatever reason it isn't, I hope you have the chance to knit vicariously. Keep on keeping on and I will see you again very soon. Bye! I'm a knitter based here in London and no idea what I say after that. That's gone well. That is a good start. Oh, this is going to be a long day. <laughs> it is a gift knit, whether it's an... Blah. Oh, it's literally like my brain doesn't keep up with what I'm saying. It's just, I'll get part way through it and my brain goes, yep, no, you're on your own. <laughs> oh, good Lord, there's not been enough coffee. Or too much, it's a fine line anyway. Should you wish to embroider? Should you wish to sew? Should you wish to calligraph? What is the verb for calligraphy? Calligraph? Calligraph? Calligrapher? I seriously with the coffee. They're from a vendor that I've seen at a number of shows as well as being a local at my LES. My, my LES, it's the Scottish version of a local yarn shop. LES, um, no. When, when did I ever think that I was gonna be showing off my ears on this podcast? This is, I'm very close right now. We can get a close up of, no, you're literally just looking at my eye. Just looking at my eye. Let me see if we can, there we go. There's my ear. Whoever thought I'd be spending this afternoon taking shots of my ear for the YouTube? I mean, there's all sorts of different fetishes out there. If this is yours, I mean, you're welcome. <laughs>